Hello and welcome to the National Association of Plant Breeders webinar series, How to Breed New Plant Varieties, Imagining and Engineering Crops. My name is David Francis and I will be serving as the host today. This is a special presentation by Dr. Michael Mazurek of Cornell University. He will be speaking about breeding of cucurbit vine crops. The title of his presentation is Cuckoo for Cucurbit Vine Crop Breeding. When Michael was a child, he dreamed of becoming a farmer, a, che a chef, or an engineer. It turns out he does a little of all three now. As the Calvin Noyes Keeney Assistant Professor of Plant Breeding at Cornell, Michael focuses on improving disease resistance and culinary qualities of pepper, peas, and cucurbits. His team supports seed systems by breeding for regional adaptation and specializes in pest and pathogen challenges that are an issue in the northeastern United States and also globally. With that brief introduction, I will turn the microphone over to Michael. Okay, well, uh, thank you and welcome, and I'm glad to tell you about the work we do uh, on cucurbits uh, at Cornell. So in the cucurbit family, um, the cucurbits is a shorthand. Uh, that refers broadly to plants in the cucurbitaceae family. Uh, another uh, shorthand you'll see, especially in uh, some uh, applied literature, refers to them as vine crops. So collectively, the cucurbitaceae cucurbits include a number of crops that uh, many of us are familiar with. Uh, so cucumber, melon, watermelon, and a number of different squash uh, and uh, that are all part of, and pumpkins that are all part of the cucurbited genus. So one of the great resources we have to, as we work with these crops, is some of the collections in the USDA National Plant Germplasm System. Uh, so, for instance, cucumber, uh, Cucinus sativus. There's a, over a thousand accessions. Uh, and cucumber, it's, it's used for everything from a fresh market slicing to pickling, uh, kind of in the U.S. Uh, melon, cucumis milo, over 2,000 accessions uh, readily available. Um, and this would include cantaloupe, honeydew, musk melon, some great sources of beta carotene and some great flavors to be found there. Watermelon, uh, Citrullus lanatus, again, many accessions. Watermelon is uh, known as a great source of lycopene uh, in the diet. There's a great bioavailability. And then all the jack-o'-lanterns, pipe crumpkins, zucchinis, winter squash, butternut, acorn, uh, all of those are in the cucurbited genus, uh, where there's a uh, split between three different species. Uh, Pepo, where you often find a lot of the jack-o'-lanterns, zucchinis, acorn squash. Moshada, which is typically uh, what we find is the butternut squash, and cucurbita maxima, which has lots of crops like uh, Hubbard and buttercup squash. So all of these different genetic seed stocks are great resources. We want to do improvement uh, in, the in the cucurbitaceae, and also a complementary resource is a gene list uh, maintained by the cucurbit genetics cooperative uh, with the, the link is there at the bottom of the slide. And what that does is it has a lot of these different crops and some of the major genes that have been found to be important for uh, improvement of these in terms of growth habit, yield, disease resistance, color, and uh, along with, uh, you can see more there, that this is a very nice roadmap for us as we do some of our uh, breeding to be able to guide uh, some of our approaches. And one of the reasons we grouped all the cucurbits together in this talk is there's some great commonalities you find between them. Uh, there are first uh, a set of really conserved needs in the cucurbits. So in terms of the pests and pathogens that affect them, uh, there are uh, several that uh, to different extents affect uh, different uh, genera in the cucurbitaceae, but are all still uh, important nonetheless. Uh, powdery mildew, uh, an image on near the top of the slide. Downy mildew, uh, relatively uh, newer pathogen to hear about. Um, that is definitely on the, the upswing in the U.S., nor Northeast, and globally. Phytophthora, Phytophthora blight, the Phytophthora capsicity is a soil-borne pathogen that's different than Phytophthora infestans, the late blight pathogen. Uh, gummy stem blight, black rot. Uh, 
Um, these are two diseases. Uh, black rot is used to describe when you see this appear uh, in a storage uh, stage of the path of uh, a winter squash. Gummy stem blight refers to uh, the same pathogen, just having a different symptom in the growing uh, tissue of the plant. Uh, some viruses, particularly in the U.S., cucumber mosaic virus and Cody viruses that can have some very pronounced leaf cyst symptoms, fruit disfigurement, and other losses. And cucumber beetles are just a ubiquitous pest, uh, pest that we have to deal with in all cucurbits. In addition to having all kind of some of the same breeding goals, another um, uh, commonality is they all have a similar breeding approach. Uh, so for the most part, uh, all the cucurbits we work with are self-compatible uh, diploids, and they have little inbreeding depression. Um, and with that, it really lends itself to a pedigree approach. Um, but one of the factors behind the little inbreeding depression uh, is that the cucurbits in general went through a uh, genetic bottleneck in their history, and that just really depressed the amount of uh, variability there was to start with. Uh, so things we can do to increase diversity is also important. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but right now, um, recurrent selection is also something that uh, works well with this crop. Um, because it's monoecious. Um, and so you get a lot of pollination happening by bees that are moving uh, pollen between male and female flowers on one plant and different plants. Um, we also, though, find a lot of other uh, forms of sex expression in the cucurbits. For instance, the uh, gynecious plants are common in high yielding cucumbers. So every flower uh, on the cucumber plant uh, makes a cucumber fruit. Uh, and andromenaceous is a trait found in melon and watermelon. And so the, the nuts and bolts of uh, kind of some of the breeding and how we go about uh, these selections after the introduction. Um, so pollination, the techniques are uh, especially easy in squash. Uh, we have an image of uh, a squash pollination where you know, it's a very big uh, flower to pollinate. Uh, all the cucurbits work essentially the same, although they might be quite a bit smaller. But so the day before, uh, we close the buds that we're going to want to cross the next morning. Uh, the key is selecting uh, buds that have full color in the petals. Uh, and if we're doing this inside in the greenhouse or we have good insect control, we don't have to worry about flying buds, uh, we can skip this step in that saves uh, quite a bit of work. Um, then uh, the other uh, step that we have to do with some flowers, actually before we close them, is there are some flowers that need to be emasculated. And so if they are perfect or complete flowers, for instance on those andromenaceous plants, we have to remove the anthers also the day before so we don't end up with a self-pollination where we want it across. So the morning of uh, the pollination, uh, first is a matter of unclipping the flowers, transferring the pollen. Uh, in the case of cucumber that doesn't produce much pollen per flower, we'll use uh, more than one male flower to do the pollination. And then it's just a matter of uh, covering the female flower with a tightly affixed bag or a gel cap for some of the smaller uh, flowers, uh, like in melons and watermelons, uh, just to make sure that no other bees get there with any other pollen. So the duration of the time we have to do these pollinations, so when pollen shed will start, will depend on the season, day length, and uh, the weather, and especially in the summer as the temperatures get really warm. As the day gets really hot, we'll find that the pollen is just viable for a shorter period in the day. So we try to get all our pollinations done before lunch in the summer. And in some of the crops uh, where we want need to uh, modify the forms of flowers that are available to us, um, so either if we need more female flowers or more male flowers, there's some chemical control that we can uh, add to be able to influence that. So for instance, if we need to increase the number of female flowers or get a male plant to produce female flowers, there's a chemical ethophon that can induce the number of female flowers. 
And there's also uh, silver compounds like silver thiosulfate that we can spray on a uh, female plant, the growing tip, to uh, make it start to produce some male flowers. Also, uh, for organic growers that want to do a seed increase of a all-female gynecious line, uh, there's some gibberellins that can be used. Uh, and so, especially with these uh, all-female lines, uh, having all the flowers in the plant yielding fruit is important uh, for yield for the grower. Uh, and it's also important for hybrid seed production, or if you have an all-female plant next to a monoecious plant, uh, you can very efficiently produce seed, uh, uh, cucumbers that way that are a hybrid where all the seed you collect off the all-female line is pollinated by the monoecious ones next to it. There's also some convenient uh, things that change during the season. Uh, for instance, watermelons are especially difficult to pollinate in the summer because the flower buds are green uh, and hidden uh, right before uh, the day before they open for pollination. So as you move into the greenhouse, especially in the winter, we find many andromanaceous flowers that become monaceous, and so that just really expedites the process. And so if we look at the whole uh, process uh, throughout the season, so right now, uh, starting yesterday, in fact, we start to sow seed and 50 cell traits to go to the field. In early June, we will transplant our hardened off seedlings. The pollinations will start in early July and continue to mid-August with some of the uh, shorter season squash like cucurbit of people flowering earlier. And then after we do a pollination, in addition to writing the male and female parents on the tag, we also include the date. And that's important uh, to make sure that we leave fruit on until the seeds are ripe and mature, which is about uh, six weeks, uh, about eight weeks for winter squash. Then we have uh, a month or two to get some data analysis done before we need to make our selection to decide on the winter generation of a plant in the greenhouse. And so we try to stage this so the winter generation is smaller. Many of these are large plants that need to be trellised in the greenhouse. Um, and so we try to have our big populations in the field. And, and also in the greenhouse generation, we set up the, the population so we can avoid selecting for traits with a lot of G by E because we don't want to be necessarily selecting for adaptation to the greenhouse in the winter uh, if we're looking for a field grown plant. And one of the challenges in cucurbit breeding, uh, I refer to it as the uncertainty principle with squash, uh, applies to all cucurbits. And so the challenge is to be able to get many of your pollinations. Uh, there will be lots of open pollinated fruit that, that uh, uh, female flowers that open and are pollinated. Uh, over the weekend or at times when we don't make it there to do the pollination or when we just don't have the right male flower uh, to use to do the pollination then. Um, so the issue is by leaving these open pollinated fruit on, we bias our ability to get a good idea of the yield quality or disease resistance scores for the plant. So for winter squash, uh, where uh, they're consumed as mature fruit, if we're continually stripping fruit off the plant, the fewer fruit that will be on uh, at the end of the season uh, will be uh, biased because they will have been growing on the plant with a lower fruit load. And if we're looking at uh, something like a cucumber or a zucchini, uh, where they're consumed at the immature stage, leaving the, the pollination on the plant will actually cause fruit set to diminish. And so in either case, leaving uh, those fruit on the plant or taking them off are going to bias uh, the phenotype we observe of the plant and how we evaluate it, if it will advance or not in the breeding program. So one of the ways we have right now to get around this uh, is by taking cuttings. And so it can be rather disheartening at the end of the season after we've made thousands of pollinations in the field by closing flowers, marking with flags, coming back the next morning, uh, and finding all these plants and doing the crosses and then letting the fruit get mature and plants that take up a lot of real estate in the field is that we leave most of all that hard work behind. And so often, you know, at least 90% of those plants will stay behind uh, in the field. And so anything we can do to reduce that workload can really help us make progress. 
So um, right now, uh, we are having more efforts with recurrent selection, but with open pollination that really only works for the maternal genetics because the, the pollen could have come from a plant that had undesirable characteristics. Luckily, most of the cucurbits, especially the vining types, root readily from cuttings. You'll see them putting uh, uh, roots out of the nodes as they trail along the ground, and so this is something that works really well. And by having cuttings instead of uh, working with doing a self or cross pollination on all the plants in the field, we can work with much larger populations. So moving from uh, hundreds of plants to thousands of plants. And having those much larger populations, uh, uh, while it results in fewer generations per year, we can get more gain per generation with less effort. And so we'll put eight, uh, a couple thousand, up to 10,000 plants in the field, uh, walk the field at the end of the season, and make our selection, uh, root a cutting, bring it back to the greenhouse, root it, and then we have our whole, um, instead of pollinating uh, hundreds of plants or those thousands of plants, we're just uh, focusing on the uh, few percent of the population we actually wanted to advance. The major uh, downside with this, in addition to reducing the number of generations per year, is that it also uh, makes your population, your selections vulnerable to disease. So in cucurbits, there are uh, the seed-borne pathogens are fortunately uh, mostly able to be uh, controlled by having a disinfectant wash of the seed. Uh, but uh, when we're moving cuttings in, that vegetative tissue uh, can often have some different uh, viral issues uh, that uh, while the plant can grow out of them uh, in really favorable growing conditions, uh, that is something that gets maintained and moved to the greenhouse that we would prefer to avoid. And as we are starting to look at some new techniques, especially genomic selection, and see how we can apply it to service, our interests are different than uh, many other people that um, are working, especially in the grains, where it's this process that we're trying to come up with alternatives to. So being able to only move, only transplant plants to the field that had uh, a good breeding value. Uh, instead of going through the process of doing many pollinations uh, that end up not being kept or just taking cuttings, which has the other effect of slowing down the number of generations per year. Um, so with that, looking at kind of the, the mechanics of how we do uh, the breeding, I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities, some uh, progress we've been able to make, uh, and directions we are looking forward to going in the future. So one of the common needs I mentioned earlier uh, is a pathogen downy mildew. Uh, so it, especially in cucumbers, which uh, are the most sensitive to the pathogen, uh, it can result in the death of the plant within a couple of weeks after the pathogen moves in. It's a windborne pathogen, uh, an oomycete like Phytophthora, uh, and the symptoms are quite diagnostic on cucumber, where you will see these uh, yellow uh, and brown sectors being restricted by the veins showing up on the top side of the leaf. And especially in cucumbers, this was a disease we hadn't really had to worry about for quite some time. Uh, the genetic resistance was perfectly adequate. But with a, a recent change in the, the strains of the spores that are in the Northeast and globally, uh, we've seen this resistance break down. And so the, the symptoms are quite obvious, um, and but that really helps us with the breeding. Uh, so if we look at the picture of a, a field selection um, in the bottom left corner, uh, you can see we have a, a field of, in this year, hundreds of plants. Uh, the survivors from the breeding are quite obvious. That is where you see a plant left in the field so simply by taking cuttings of that and bringing that back to the greenhouse, uh, we can be able to get uh, resistant plants out of those selected populations. Uh, downy mildew is also a problem on squash, uh, melons, uh, watermelons, 
the symptoms are less conspicuous. Uh, so if you were to look at the top of a, the leaf, it wouldn't have such a diagnostic pattern as a cucumber. You see some chlorotic regions. The diagnostic aspect is to look on the bottom side of the leaf, and so you'll have regions, uh, like I'm pointing now in the bottom right, where you see uh, some of the telltale uh, purplish black sporulation. Uh, and by moving plant leaves uh, from the field and putting them in a wet paper towel in the refrigerator, uh, we can actually stimulate uh, the sporulation so you can get the pathogen to reveal itself if the symptoms are obvious already in the field. So the cycle uh, that's worked well with cucumbers is a process of screening the available germplasm, uh, looking at lines that were previously reported as being re resistant, looking at uh, different breeding lines that had been uh, in the Cornell program for decades as the sources of resistance had been selected for resistance as the focal trait. Uh, and also looking to some varieties that growers had very enterprisingly uh, turned to to look for uh, different cultivars they could grow despite the downy mildew pressure. Uh, then we create some biparental F2 populations, uh, sow the seed uh, a month before the anticipated spore arrival. So in New York, the spores blow across from the Great Lakes region and up the coast from where they can overwinter in Florida. So we're at the intersection of uh, quite a bit of uh, downy mildew pressure. And then the cyclic process is uh, indicated in this diagram below where uh, starting at the bottom we'll have a very large population in this field at the image of. We will look for resistant plants. We will then take cuttings, root them in the greenhouse, and sell or cross-pollinate them in the winter. Then with cucumber, we have just enough time to get in a second generation where we either uh, self or intermate those plants. We can get it just out to the field in time to plant again. And this approach is rather basic. However, it has been really successful. Uh, so uh, this uh, on the top two panels, you can see some of the resistant uh, green uh, breeding lines uh, we've uh, been able to develop by this approach. Uh, so New York BMR 264 we published on recently. Uh, there is a related line, uh, 257. Um, and so the resistance of these is quite good. Uh, some of the sources of resistance we use in this were some uh, cultivars of intermediate resistance. Market more in 97, a Cornell land that had been selected for disease resistance as the paramount characteristic. And Ivory Queen, uh, another uh, cucumber uh, we found that was performing well in some preliminary screens. And you can see uh, how well these per uh, perform compared to some of the other cucumbers. So, for instance, uh, Piccolino is a very tasty, early, high yielding plant but it's one of our susceptible controls. So for downy mildew, we've made some great progress in cucumber, especially, and are looking at that in all the other cucurbits. Another pest that is ubiquitous, universal, has been, uh, since there have been uh, cucurbits, is uh, the striped cucumber beetle. So this is a specialist pest uh, which feeds on uh, the cucurbit plant. And cucurbits tend to have a bitter compound cucurbitation, and so the cucumber beetle actually can accumulate uh, that compound as a defense compound. So it really leads to a lack of good biological control. Uh, other beneficial insects, for example, or other things that would eat them. Uh, and so really there's few control measures. Um, the uh, conventional growers have recently had very uh, good control uh, with some systemic uh, insecticides. Uh, however, uh, some of the use of those uh, is now being questioned, and so some of the techniques the organic growers have been using in terms of row covers uh, uh, are effective, but not necessarily scalable, so we need some other approaches. So in addition to the defoliation, uh, you can see on the left of these cucumber beetles, 
The other thing they'll do is transmit some diseases such as squash mosaic virus and bacterial wilt. So on the bottom right, you can see some uh, plants that have been, uh, zucchini plants have been defoliated or se severely wilting. Uh, and so there are a lot of people that really suffer from those types of cucumber beetle pressure annually. Uh, however, there is hope. Um, if by screening through material, looking at some older literature, it's possible to find plants such as in the, the top right that do very well. They have fewer cucumber beetles seeding on them uh, during their growth, and as you can see, much less damage. And so this is work that we are pursuing to hopefully develop uh, techniques across the cucurbits where we can have a natural non-preference through striped cucumber beetles. And the, the key to finding this, the downy mildew resistance, is just broadly looking through a lot of those germplasm resources I started off the talk uh, focusing on. Uh, and so here is a grow where we found some what turned out to be promising Phytophthora resistance and uh, downy mildew resistance in the cucurbit of Pipo collection. Uh, so there are, well, that year there were approximately 800 accessions available. You can see in the top panel, uh, looking through the field, uh, there's a lot of variability uh, for uh, resistance. Uh, and so you can see uh, in the, the right-hand panel uh, a very green lush squash. This is a cultivar Romulus, previously released by the Cornell program, that has really great powdery and downy mildew resistance introgress from a wild species, Cucurbita martinesii. And some of the other plants that are uh, succumbing to powdery and downy mildew uh, in the foreground. And so by screening this collection with this control, we are able to look for new sources of resistance, partial resistances that can be combined, uh, both as ways to be able to have um, improved sources of resistance, but also alternative sources of resistance. Uh, for much of the mildew resistance we rely on in squash, uh, much of that just comes from one wild accession uh, and some introgressions from that to confer the resistance. So you can see the vulnerability if there were ever to be a resistance breaking strain, which uh, some people have indicated might have been starting to appear already. And so to be able to help us uh, go through the field, in addition to all the great phenotypic diversity we have available to us, uh, we've been investing in, and many others have been investing in, developing some improved genotyping resources for the cucurbits. Cucumber, watermelon, and melon have benefited from already having sequenced genomes and much investment to, to develop many types of molecular tools in those crops. The cucurbita as the winter squash, summer squash, um, and pumpkins have had less investment, um, but they are now rapidly catching up. There are some initial draft genomes becoming available and some different SNPs that are being developed from sequencing efforts for transcriptome sequencing. Uh, we are engaged in some transcriptome sequencing looking at food quality ourselves. The approach that's really helping us bridge this gap in uh, cucurbita, and actually we're widely deploying this in all our crops, is genotyping by sequencing. And so this is a uh, increasingly common technique, uh, especially as we move into crops that have fewer resources. So we've found that as we digest the genomes uh, with APK1, that restriction enzyme can prepare uh, especially useful libraries. Uh, where we're trying to get thousands of markers uh, by this approach in squash and most of our other crops. Uh, especially in cucurbits where we have that genetic bottleneck back in the history, this is limited, so we're looking at thousands of markers, not hundreds of thousands or even millions. Uh, however, it is a good leap forward and it's a very adaptable approach. And so an example, uh, uh, some of the coverage we're getting in cucumber. Uh, so we have depicted the uh, all the different chromosomes of cucumber, the nuclear chromosomes, uh, and all the blue bars indicate where we have a GBS tag uh, hitting their region, and the 
height of the bar indicates the number of time we're hitting that region. So you can see we have uh, quite good coverage for most of our purposes, and especially as we have our sequenced genomes that then allows us to move rather rapidly to the gene. So in the end, after we have developed a new uh, variety, uh, something that's a candidate, something we want to increase in share uh, to a variety of growers, seed companies, is to do seed production. And so we have uh, a small array of pollination cages uh, that makes a, a cute little city uh, when they're all assembled. Uh, so you can see the inside of one here. Uh, so they're 12 foot by 48 mesh cages with a steel support. We plant uh, into that after the uh, structure uh, is constructed every season. And to do the pollination, uh, we have a little bee nuke. Uh, so you can see the small hive here in the center with honeybees where they'll come stocked with thousands of honeybees and they do a great job with the pollination. Uh, as we extract the seed, we pay attention to uh, both in the pollination cages and everywhere else in the program to be getting uh, only be collecting seed from uh, non-diseased plants uh, or using some different sanitation measures if we must collect that seed, uh, getting it extracted, fermented, cleaned up, dried down, and then moving it to uh, some longer term storage facilities. Uh, so here is an image of many of our seeds uh, tucked away in our seed storage facility that is uh, climate controlled with low temperatures, low humidity. Um, if uh, you like this facility, uh, uh, putting it in your refrigerator at home with some dry rice in a glass jar, uh, well, this is how we did it before we had this facility. And so as the, one of the major selection criteria we have in addition to the pest and pathogen resistance is quality. Uh, so especially with the winter squash, uh, watermelon, uh, cantaloupe, muskmelon, uh, bricks is an important measure of the soluble solids. So it's very possible to have a high bricks uh, fruit uh, with poor flavor, but you never find a great flavor fruit with poor bricks. And so it's a great way to do some screening in the field. Uh, so some of the crops like melon and watermelon are very easy to do a brick measurement on where you can just simply squeeze the juice right from the right fruit. Uh, for a crop like winter squash, which is much harder and takes quite a feat of strength to be able to squeeze juice out of, we uh, will freeze a chunk of it in a baggie, so about a, a small piece like a pack, a pack of post-it notes or half a hockey puck uh, in the freezer. Um, and then we'll let it thaw the next morning, then snip a corner of the baggie, and we can squeeze the liquid out of that after the fruit has been through a freeze-thaw cycle that has broken up the cells. Another measurement, and a correlated measurement, uh, that is important, especially for the winter squashes, is dry matter. So this has a good correlation with texture. And so it's simply a process of uh, having at least a 10-gram sample we find works uh, for our crop. Uh, thinly slicing it, weighing it, uh, putting it in a food dehydrator on high overnight, and then when the weight stops changing, weighing, weighing it again, and that difference is the amount of dry matter, which is not water, uh, that is in the sample. Also, we spend a lot of time looking at color uh, and for all the nutritional information that's behind that in terms of the carotenoid content. So we have some visual assessments, uh, HPLC, when we need to do uh, very precise measurements, but a colorimeter uh, is an instrument that works very well in the meantime, especially for lots of screening. Winter squash, uh, when we want to do these measurements, it is best to wait until after the fruit has been cured. Uh, and so on the, on the left is an image of uh, many of our selections in a greenhouse uh, curing, being prepared for storage and quality evaluation where in these vented blue bins, we have different plot selections that have their barcoded tags hanging down from their handles so we can go through uh, all those fruit efficiently. And on the other side of the house, you see all our red onion bags that are full of uh, plant selections of squash uh, where we want to have a much, uh, where we have a much smaller sample of fruit, but still want to cure it uh, before we do that final selection. 
So in addition to quality improving, we also put them in a long-term storage uh, to look at uh, their ability to uh, be able to last through the winter months. Uh, and one of the uh, main characteristics we're looking for there is uh, an absence of black rot symptoms. So initially I talked about gummy stem blight, how it could be one pathogen causes that symptom on the foliage. Here is that same pathogen uh, causing its namesake black rot symptoms on a squash fruit. And so this is a storage disease that shows up after a grower has put their fruit into storage. So selecting varieties that are not prone to this is really important as well. So looking to the future, uh, some of the characteristics we're working on in addition to some of this disease resistance work and pest resistance work that's really important for getting a good harvest is smaller fruit, a diversity of shapes. Um, we've seen many of these trends, I'm sure, in your local supermarket. Uh, much of our work is in organic systems where we're looking for regional adaptation and uh, hopefully finding also traits that are important in a larger scale as well. Looking at nutrition uh, and culinary quality uh, is a, a pair because a lot of nutritional compounds uh, affect some of the flavor quality and many vegetables are very nutritious and the key uh, to improving health through their consumption is increasing consumption. We also are looking for ways to make them more resilient uh, to unpredictable seasons uh, and so finding crops that are shorter or store well or some of the work in high tunnels really helps answer that. And one of the keys that we've been starting to do uh, is to introduce variation uh, from a more diverse source. Uh, so as I mentioned a, a couple of times there are uh, has been a uh, genetic bottleneck in the history of the cucurbitaceae, at least one. Uh, and so we get some of our best uh, traits introduced into our, some of our populations by looking across the globe, uh, especially to Southeast Asia and bringing that into some of the genetics we're using here in the Northeast. And so here's an example uh, in butternut where we have a regular butternut squash. Uh, some of the great work that have been done here at Cornell to increase the quality came from introducing some quality traits from buttercup and other species. And we continue to try to work on that by looking to some other Southeast Asian varieties where we can bring a lot of good dry matter traits to combine with the hybrids. As we've looked for downy mild resistance, invariably we find some uh, resistances that combine the best with ours also in uh, Southeast Asian uh, cultivars and varieties. So uh, with that, I would like to mention some of the people that have contributed to the work I presented. Uh, much of the data uh, done by my students, William Holdworth and Lindsay Wyatt, uh, a great uh, crew uh, that works with us. Um, and also uh, from many of the examples I described, uh, we are fortunate to get some uh, grant support to be able to make that possible, uh, in addition to uh, some great support from Seed Matters, uh, also some USDA grants where you might recognize the names of some of the teams, uh, ASOQ and NOVIC that have been instrumental in much of the regional edit and other work. Michael, thank you for your presentation and thanks to our audience for coming.